Hey everyone, welcome back to another video. Today I'm taking a look at the Armageddon Nimitz N5 Aurora PC case. Now, this thing is actually the cheapest case I've ever bought, uh, coming in at 35 Australian dollars, and I imagine it would probably be cheaper in uh, America or Asia. So you're probably thinking, what do you actually get for $35? So, you get a uh, tempered glass side panel, and you also get an RGB implementation that's controlled with the little button at the top. So. Uh, yeah, we'll be taking a look at it today, we'll be, uh, comparing it against some other cases the thermal-wise, and, uh, yeah, let's just get straight into a review. So when I unboxed it, the first thing I noticed was the foam, more specifically how loose it was on the case. This really isn't great to see, especially if you're getting the case shipped to on a long haul, as it's pretty likely that it will get damaged during shipping. Anyway, let's take a look at the case itself. The front I.O. consists of a power button, the front lighting button which can also be rewired to be a regular or reset switch, headphone and audio jacks, two USB 2.0 ports and one USB 3.0 port. Continuing on with the top of the case, there's a singular fan mount here with an included magnetic dust filter. However, something to note with this top fan is that it can come in contact with your motherboard's heat sinks if they're tall enough. Moving down to the front panel. It's just made up of a big bit of plastic that's pretty much sealed except for a slither around the LED diffuser and the hole at the bottom which you can use to remove the panel. On the inside of the front panel you'll see the LED strip and aforementioned LED diffuser, both of which can be taken off the panel as they're just held on with screws. Underneath the case there's an included magnetic dust filter for the power supply. However, I wouldn't actually recommend using it as the holes on it are pretty small, so it can potentially negatively impact airflow. The case also sits on chrome looking plastic feet that are pretty wide, so they provide a good amount of stability for the case. And coming around to the back, there's a non-adjustable 120mm fan mount and four non-reusable PCIe slot covers. Taking off the glass side panel is nice and simple with four metal thumb screws in each corner. The only issue I found with this mount is that the thumb screws don't actually have any kind of vibration dampener on them, so it's just straight metal on glass, which can actually lead to the glass shattering. But anyway, moving on to the other side panel, it is also super simple with just a couple of thumb screws and some metal clips holding it in place. Now moving inside the case, there's a little resealable bag with all the screws in it. The screws included consist of 8 fan screws to mount fans to the power supply basement, 4 hexagonal power supply screws, 10 unpainted motherboard and SSD screws, and 4 unpainted hard drive screws. Oh, and also a motherboard standoff. Now the funny thing with the screws is there's actually not even enough to properly install one hard drive and one SSD with the motherboard also installed. So whether or not that's a deal breaker, I'll leave that up to you. Speaking of how many drives you can install, let's move on to drive support. There's room for two SSDs and two hard drives, however the bottom SSD mount might not work for you as it can only use flat SATA data and power cables. Not to mention with longer power supplies, this spot isn't even usable because of how long the power supply can get. As for the hard drive mounts though, you can occupy both just fine. Moving back over to the other side of the case, there's five pre-installed motherboard standoffs, two cutouts for cable management for thinner boards, a cable channel for standard micro ATX boards like this MSI one for example, and a CPU power cable cutout which is covered up by any board, so I'd actually recommend plugging that in before installing any motherboard. There's also cutouts on the power supply basement for routing front I.O. cables. While we're on the subject of front I.O. cables, there's one USB 3.0 cable, a USB 2.0 cable, audio cable and all the regular front button and LED connectors, except for the reset switch which is actually used to switch modes on the integrated RGB. The RGB itself actually looks pretty good for such a budget case and I was honestly surprised when I found out you could control it, unlike uh, <coughs> case com. But anyway, controlling it is super simple with a switch at the top of the case to cycle through all of its modes and colours. You can also just hold down the button to turn off the RGB. Now let's move on to fan support. There's support for 120mm at the back and at the top, however in the top position, as mentioned earlier, if your motherboard heat sinks are tall enough, you won't actually be able to put a fan here. Anyway, you can also fit three 120mm fans at the front. Unfortunately, there's no support for 140s. As for radiator support, you can fit up to a 240mm radiator at the front with about 6cm of thickness clearance thanks to the cutout on the power supply basement. 
and there's also support for 120 at the back. Also bear in mind you won't be able to use AIOs with thicker tubing such as the Corsair H80i as the tubing isn't flexible enough. But now let's get into the thermals. If you want to skip this part you can just skip to the time on screen now. The configurations we'll be testing today is stock with no fans, one exhaust fan, two exhaust fans, two exhaust fans and three intakes with the front panel on, two exhausts with three intakes with the front panel off, and two exhausts with three intakes with the front panel on, but with the LED diffuser removed to see if thermals can be improved by taking it out. First up for testing though is five runs of Cinebench R15. From the graph we can see that having no fans in the case yielded the worst results being at least 5 degrees hotter than every other result. Speaking of all the other results, they're all within margin of error so we can't really conclude anything from this graph. Next up is a 20 minute stress test of Ada 64. Just by glancing at the graph it's obvious that by adding a single fan to the case and exhaust can dramatically reduce thermals as stock is over 10 degrees hotter than one fan and exhaust. The front panel also doesn't seem to be that restrictive from this graph as taking off the front panel only reduced temps by 4 degrees. Now for Prime 95. The trend from the last graph continues here where adding a single exhaust fan reduces temps by over 10 degrees once again. And the front panel is again surprisingly not that restrictive as removing it only dropped temps by 5 degrees. And removing the LED diffuser doesn't seem to do much as well as temps only dropped by 1 degree. Moving on to GPU results though, it's a bit of a different story here as adding an exhaust fan only reduced temps by 4 degrees, but adding a second reduced temps by another 4 degrees. So for GPU temps, I definitely want to occupy the top and back fan mounts. By adding three more fans to the front, temps only reduced by a further two degrees from two exhaust fans. The biggest drop in temps is when you remove the front panel as it dropped temps by 10 degrees. So for GPU temps, the front panel is definitely pretty restrictive. Now comparing the case to other ones I've reviewed on the channel, at stock, the Nimitz N5 is the hottest case for GPU results, but comes second for hottest CPU results to the Casecom XM91. However, when we add a single exhaust fan, the Nimitz N5 becomes the best for CPU results and evens out with the Cougar and Gemini M4 best GPU results. So from all this, it's definitely a good idea to chuck an extra exhaust fan in the back. So after building in the case, the cable management didn't actually turn out too bad. The only problems I had with it was the fact that there was pretty much zero room behind the motherboard tray so I had to force the side panel on and the fact that there are only three cable tie down loops. Other than that it was pretty decent with the cutout on the power supply basement doubling as a cutout for PCIe cables and the cable channel being handy for the front IO cables as you can round them through the opening at the top. But anyway moving on to clearance there's room for CPU coolers up to 170 millimeters meaning coolers like the NHD14 and Hyper212 can fit with no problems and as for graphics card clearance there's room for up to a 300 millimeter graphics card however if you install the front fans that number comes down to 275 millimeters and as for power supply clearance I'd recommend going for anything under 180 millimeters. So in conclusion this case is pretty damn decent for the price. At $10 cheaper than the Matrix 30 I'd say it's actually better value with a power supply basement and integrated RGB. The main problems I have with the case is the lack of room behind the motherboard tray for cable management, the shortage of screws to install two hard drives and two SSDs, and the pretty intrusive branding on the tempered glass. But anyway the case is overall a decent buy, just don't get it if it's coming on a long haul because it'll probably live in pieces due to the crappy packaging. So that does it for this review. If you enjoyed it or found it helpful, feel free to leave a like. If you didn't like it, I'd appreciate some feedback in the comments. And if you want to see more content like this, you might want to consider subscribing. And also, if you want to get more involved with the channel, there's a Discord link in the description or comments. I'll leave it somewhere. Anyway, see y'all.